Hello, in this video we're going to discuss subgroups and then we're going to do a proof where we prove that a specific set is a subgroup. So let's start by looking at a group which we'll call G. So let G be a group. And we're going to let H be a subset of G. And then H is actually a subgroup of G if it's also a group under the same operation as G is a group. However, in practice, it's easier to use some defined criteria that we can follow in order to do the proofs. So I'm going to give you that criteria here, and you can use that to do subgroup proofs. So we say H is a subgroup. of G if the following conditions hold. And these conditions are nice because all you have to do when you're trying to show something is a subgroup is you just check each of these conditions. So the first condition is that the identity element, which is E, is in H. The second condition is that H is closed under the group operation. This basically means given any two elements X, Y, and H, the product is also an H. So for all X, Y, and H, we have that the product X times Y is also an H. Again, this is that uh, H is closed under the group operation. That's how you say this. And three is that H is closed under inverses. So basically this means that every element in H has an inverse. So for all X and H, we have that X inverse is also in H. So if all three of these conditions are satisfied, then we say H is a subgroup of G. Obviously, H has to be a subset of G, and you have to have uh, all of these conditions. Let's go ahead and do a simple example where we prove a specific set is a subgroup. So here's our setup. This is a little bit different. So let's start by letting F from G into H be a group homomorphism. Group homomorphism. And so here G and H are groups. And we're going to prove that the kernel of F and I'm going to use this less than or equal to notation here, is a subgroup of G. So this, this notation means subgroup. Subgroup. Just some fun notation that we can introduce to denote subgroup. So you might be wondering, what is the kernel of F? And what is a group homomorphism? So a group homomorphism is a map that preserves the multiplication, basically whenever you have f of x times y, this is equal to f of x times f of y. And this is true for all x, y, and g. This is the definition of a group homomorphism. Here the multiplication takes place in g, and here the multiplication takes place in h. As far as this cur f, that's called the kernel of f. So the kernel of f, is equal to the set of all of the x's in G that get mapped to the identity. So we have that f of x is equal to the identity element in H, so E sub H. So if you have an element in the kernel, it's going to get sent to the identity. So we have to prove that this set is a subgroup of G. 
Okay, let's carefully go through this and verify all of the conditions. Proof. And I'm just gonna number them just like we did in our criteria up here. So our first condition is that the identity element uh, is also in H. So that's pretty easy to verify. So note that F of the identity element in G is equal to the identity element in H. And this is because F is a group homomorphism. So this requires proof. And uh, typically by the time you see this, um, you've, you've already proved it. So if you take uh, the identity element in G and you apply F, you're gonna get the identity element in H. And that's because it's a group homomorphism. So what is this saying exactly? It's saying that this is an element, E sub G, that gets mapped to E sub H. So that's precisely what it means for the identity element in G to be in the kernel of F. And so that takes care of the first condition. For the second condition, we have to show that the kernel is closed under the group operation. So it's up here, it says for all X, Y, and H, we have X, Y, and H. So we'll start by taking any two elements, X, Y, in the kernel of F. So take any, X, Y, in the kernel, of F. And we have to show that the product uh, is in the kernel. However, the natural thing to do now is to write down what it means for X and Y to be in the kernel. So this means, well, if X is in the kernel, that means, if X is in the kernel, that means that F takes X and sends it to the identity element in H. Likewise, y is in the kernel, that means f takes y and sends it to the identity element in H. Now we have to show that the product xy is in the kernel, so we're hoping that f takes the product and sends it to the identity element in H. So then, the natural thing to do now is look at the product and apply f and hope that this is equal to the identity. Well, we can do something here because we know something about F. F is a group homomorphism, so we can apply the property of group homomorphisms. So this is the same thing as F of X times F of Y. And this is because F is a group homomorphism. So um, it should be written somewhere or it should be said. So let me just say, because it's a homomorphism. And f of x is equal to the identity element in H. That's because x is in the kernel. And f of y is equal to the identity element in H. And the identity times the identity is just the identity. And so now we have that f takes xy and sends it to the identity. That's precisely what it means for the product xy to be inside the kernel of f. So we started with any two elements, xy in the kernel, and we show that the product is in the kernel. That takes care of the second condition, right? So for all x, y, and h, we have the product in h. So the kernel is closed under the group operation. The last condition is to show that the kernel is closed under inverses. So for all x in the kernel, we have to have that the inverse is also in the kernel. Let me show you the third condition. It's up here for all x and h. We have x inverse in h. Okay, so take any x in the kernel. And you can do this in a more streamlined fashion. I'm just going very slowly and showing all the steps and breaking it down into steps. So take any x in the kernel of f, then that means that f of x is equal to the identity element in h. Now we have to show that x inverse uh, is in the kernel. So certainly X inverse exists because the kernel is a subset of G, G is a group, so the inverse exists. So, you know, that's something that should be said. So, you know, inverses do exist. So we just have to show it's in the kernel, right? Because we know it's going to be in G, but we don't know if it's in the kernel yet. So let me just write that down since X is in the kernel of F. This is a bit, a bit pedantic here, but why not? And that's a subset of G. 
we have x and g. So x inverses and g. So x inverse exists, and that's because g is a group and g itself is closed under inverses. And whether or not you say this is up to you, I think, but you should at least think about it and be aware of you know, the existence of the inverse uh, is guaranteed uh, by the fact that g is actually a group. All right, so now we have to show that this inverse is in the kernel. So the next thing to do now would be to look at f of x inverse. Well, what is this? This is f of x inverse. And this is a property of group homomorphisms. This does require proof. It's a really easy proof, but nevertheless, it's something that needs to be proven. So I'm going to assume that you've already seen this. And f of x is e sub h. So the inverse of the identity is the identity. So we have that f of x inverse is equal to the identity element in h. That's precisely what it means for x inverse to be in the kernel of f. So for any x in the kernel of f, we have that x inverse is also in the kernel of f. So this shows that the kernel is closed under inverses. So we've satisfied all three criteria for the kernel to be a subgroup. We've shown that the identity element is in the kernel. We've shown that the kernel is closed under the group operation, and we've shown that the kernel is closed under inverses. So therefore, the kernel is a subgroup of G. So therefore, the kernel of F is a subgroup of G, and that completes the proof. So it's a really simple proof, um, you know, when compared to some of the other proofs that you can do in, um, you know, group theory and abstract algebra, but I wanted to make this introductory video, so hopefully, uh, someone watching this uh, can learn a little bit of math. It's really cool, and hopefully you've understood some of this and you've learned. Even if you've learned one thing, then that's good. I hope it's been helpful. Good luck.